Section 4 of The Chorus Girl and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The Chorus Girl and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. Translated by Constance Garnett. My Life. The Story of a Provincial. Part 2. One day after dinner, he ran breathless into the lodge and said, Go along, your sister has come. I went out, and there I found a hired brake from the town standing before the entrance of the great house. My sister had come in it with Anuta Blagovo and a gentleman in a military tunic. Going up closer, I recognized the latter. It was the brother of Anuta Blagova, the army doctor. We have come to you for a picnic, he said. Is that all right? My sister and Anuta wanted to ask how I was getting on here, but both were silent and simply gazed at me. I was silent too. They saw that I did not like the place, and tears came into my sister's eyes while Anuta Blagova turned crimson. We went into the garden. The doctor walked ahead of us all and said enthusiastically, What air! Holy mother! What air! In appearance he was still a student, and he walked and talked like a student, and the expression of his grey eyes was as keen, honest, and frank as a nice student's. Beside his tall and handsome sister, he looked frail and thin. And his beard was thin, too, and his voice, too, was a thin but rather agreeable tenor. He was serving in a regiment somewhere, and had come home to his people for a holiday, and said he was going in the autumn to Petersburg for his examination as a doctor of medicine, he was already a family man, with a wife and three children, and had married very young, in his second year at the university, and now people in the town said he was unhappy in his family life, and was not living with his wife. "'What time is it?' my sister asked uneasily. "'We must get back in good time. Papa let me come to see my brother on condition I was back at six. "'Oh, bother your papa!' sighed the doctor. I set the samovar. We put down a carpet before the veranda of the great house and had our tea there, and the doctor knelt down, drank out of his saucer, and declared that he now knew what bliss was. Then Cheprakov came with the key and opened the glass door, and we all went into the house. There it was, half dark and mysterious, and smelt of mushrooms, and our footsteps had a hollow sound as though there were cellars under the floor. The doctor stopped and touched the keys of the piano, and it responded faintly with a husky, quivering, but melodious chord. He tried his voice and sang a song, frowning and tapping impatiently with his foot when some note was mute. My sister did not talk about going home, but walked about the rooms and kept saying, How happy I am! How happy I am! There was a note of astonishment in her voice, as though it seemed to her incredible that she too could feel light-hearted. It was the first time in my life I had seen her so happy. She actually looked prettier. In profile, she did not look nice. Her nose and mouth seemed to stick out and had an expression as though she were pouting. But she had beautiful dark eyes, a pale, very delicate complexion, and a touching expression of goodness and melancholy. And when she talked, she seemed charming and even beautiful. We both, she and I, took after our mother were broad-shouldered, strongly built, and capable of endurance, but her pallor was a sign of ill health. She often had a cough, and I sometimes 
caught in her face that look one sees in people who are seriously ill, but for some reason conceal the fact. There was something naive and childish in her gaiety now, as though the joy that had been suppressed and smothered in our childhood by harsh education had now suddenly awakened in her soul and found a free outlet. But when evening came on and the horses were brought round, my sister sank into silence and looked thin and shrunken, and she got into the brake as though she were going to the scaffold. When they had all gone, and the sound had died away, I remembered that Anuta Blagovo had not said a word to me all day. She is a wonderful girl, I thought. Wonderful girl! St. Peter's fast came, and we had nothing but Lenten dishes every day. I was weighed down by physical depression due to idleness and my unsettled position, and dissatisfied with myself. Listless and hungry, I lounged about the garden and only waited for a suitable mood to go away. Towards evening, one day when Radish was sitting in the lodge, Dolzhikov, very sunburnt and grey with dust, walked in unexpectedly. He had been spending three days on his land and had come now to Dubechnya by the steamer and walked to us from the station. While waiting for the carriage, which was to come for him from the town, he walked round the grounds with his bailiff, giving orders in a loud voice, then sat for a whole hour in our lodge, writing letters. While he was there, telegrams came for him, and he himself tapped off the answers. We three stood in silence at attention. "'What a muddle!' he said, glancing contemptuously at a record book. In a fortnight I am transferring the office to the station, and I don't know what I am to do with you, my friends. I do my best, Your Honor, said Chaprakov. To be sure I see how you do your best. The only thing you can do is to take your salary, the engineer went on looking at me. You keep relying on patronage to faire la carrière, as quickly and as easily as possible. Well, I don't care for patronage. No one took any trouble on my behalf. Before they gave me a railway contract, I went about as a mechanic and worked in Belgium as an oiler. And you, Pantile, what are you doing here? He asked, turning to Radish. Drinking with them? He, for some reason, always called humble people Pantile, and such as me and Chiprakov he despised and called them drunkards, beasts, and rabble to their faces. Altogether he was cruel to humble subordinates and used to fine them and turn them off coldly without explanations. At last the horses came for him. As he said goodbye, he promised to turn us all off in a fortnight. He called his bailiff a blockhead and then lolling at ease in his carriage, drove back to the town. Andrei Ivanch, I said to Radish, take me on as a workman. Oh, all right. And we set off together in the direction of the town. When the station and the big house with its buildings were left behind, I asked, Andrei Ivanch, why did you come to Dubechny this evening? In the first place, my fellows are working on the line, and in the second place, I came to pay the general's lady my interest. Last year I borrowed fifty roubles from her, and I pay her now a rouble a month interest. The painter stopped and took me by the button. Miss Alexeyevich, our angel, he went on. The way I look at it is that if any man, gentle or simple, takes even the smallest interest, he is doing evil. There cannot be truth and justice in such a man. Radish, lean, pale, dreadful-looking, shut his eyes, shook his head, and, in the tone of a philosopher, pronounced, Lice consume the grass, rust consumes the iron, 
and lying the soul lord have mercy upon us sinners radish was not practical and was not at all good at forming an estimate he took more work than he could get through and when calculating he was agitated lost his head and so was almost always out of pocket over his jobs he undertook painting glazing paper hanging and even tiling roofs and i can remember his running about for three days to find tilers for the sake of a paltry job he was a first-rate workman he sometimes earned as much as ten roubles a day and if it had not been for the desire at all costs to be a master and to be called a contractor he would probably have had plenty of money he was paid by the job but he paid me and the other workmen by the day from one and twopence to two shillings a day when it was fine and dry we did all kinds of outside work chiefly painting roofs when i was new to the work it made my feet burn as though i were walking on hot bricks and when i put on felt boots they were hotter than ever but this was only at first later on i got used to it and everything went swimmingly i was living now among people to whom labor was obligatory inevitable and who worked like cart horses often with no idea of the moral significance of labor and indeed never using the word labor in conversation at all beside them i too felt like a cart horse growing more and more imbued with the feeling of the obligatory and inevitable character of what i was doing and this made my life easier setting me free from all doubt and uncertainty at first everything interested me everything was new as though i had been born again i could sleep on the ground and go about barefoot and that was extremely pleasant i could stand in a crowd of the common people and be no constraint to any one and when a cab horse fell down in the street i ran to help it up without being afraid of soiling my clothes and the best of it all was i was living on my own account and no burden to any one painting roofs especially with our own oil and colors was regarded as a particularly profitable job and so this rough dull work was not disdained even by such good workmen as radish in short breeches and wasted purple-looking legs he used to go about the roofs looking like a stork and i used to hear him as he plied his brush breathing heavily and saying woe woe to us sinners he walked about the roofs as freely as though he were upon the ground in spite of his being ill and pale as a corpse his agility was extraordinary he used to paint the domes and cupolas of the churches without scaffolding like a young man with only the help of a ladder and a rope and it was rather horrible when standing on a height far from the earth he would draw himself up erect and for some unknown reason pronounce lice consume grass rust consumes iron and lying the soul or thinking about something would answer his thoughts aloud anything may happen anything may happen when i went home from my work all the people who were sitting on benches by the gates all the shopmen and boys and their employers made sneering and spiteful remarks after me and this upset me at first and seemed to be simply monstrous better than nothing i heard on all sides house painter yellow ochre and none behaved so ungraciously to me as those who had only lately been humble people themselves and had earned their bread by hard manual labor in the streets full of shops i was once passing an ironmonger's when water was thrown over me as though by accident and on one occasion someone darted out with a stick at me while a fishmonger a grey-headed old man barred my way and said looking at me angrily i am not sorry for you you fool 
it's your father i'm sorry for and my acquaintances were for some reason overcome with embarrassment when they met me some of them looked upon me as a queer fish and a comic fool others were sorry for me others did not know what attitude to take up to me and it was difficult to make them out one day i met anuta blagova in a side street near great dvoryansky street i was going to work and was carrying two long brushes and a pail of paint recognizing me anuta flushed crimson please do not bow to me in the street she said nervously harshly and in a shaking voice without offering me her hand and tears suddenly gleamed in her eyes if to your mind all this is necessary so be it so be it but i beg you not to meet me i no longer lived in great dvoryansky street but in the suburb with my old nurse karpovna a good-natured but gloomy old woman who always foreboded some harm was afraid of all dreams and even in the bees and wasps that flew into her room saw omens of evil and the fact that i had become a workman to her thinking boded nothing good your life is ruined she would say mournfully shaking her head ruined her adopted son prokofy a huge uncouth red-headed fellow of thirty with bristling moustaches a butcher by trade lived in the little house with her when he met me in the passage he would make way for me in respectful silence and if he was drunk he would salute me with all five fingers at once he used to have supper in the evening and through the partition wall of boards i could hear him clear his throat and sigh as he drank off glass after glass mamma he would call in an undertone well karpovna who was passionately devoted to her adopted son would respond what is it sonny i can show you a testimony of my affection mamma all this earthly life i will cherish you in your declining years in this veil of tears and when you die i will bury you at my expense i have said it and you can believe it i got up every morning before sunrise and went to bed early we house painters ate a great deal and slept soundly the only thing amiss was that my heart used to beat violently at night i did not quarrel with my mates violent abuse desperate oaths and wishes such as blast your eyes or cholera take you never ceased all day but nevertheless we lived on very friendly terms the other fellows suspected me of being some sort of religious sectary and made good-natured jokes at my expense saying that even my own father had disowned me and thereupon would add that they rarely went into the temple of god themselves and that many of them had not been to confession for ten years they justified this laxity on their part by saying that a painter among men was like a jackdaw among birds the men had a good opinion of me and treated me with respect it was evident that my not drinking not smoking but leading a quiet steady life pleased them very much it was only an unpleasant shock to them that i took no hand in stealing oil and did not go with them to ask for tips from people on whose property we were working stealing oil and paints from those who employed them was a house painter's custom and was not regarded as theft and it was remarkable that even so upright a man as radish would always carry away a little white lead and oil as he went home from work and even the most respectable old fellows who owned the houses in which they lived in the suburb were not ashamed to ask for a tip and it made me feel vexed and ashamed to see the men go in a body to congratulate some nonentity on the commencement of the completion of the job and thank him with degrading servility when they had received a few coppers with people on whose work they were engaged 
they behaved like wily courtiers and almost every day i was reminded of shakespeare's polonius i fancy it is going to rain the man whose house was being painted would say looking at the sky it is there is not a doubt it is the painters would agree i don't think it is a rain cloud though perhaps it won't rain after all no it won't your honor i'm sure it won't but their attitude to their patrons behind their backs was usually one of irony and when they saw for instance a gentleman sitting in the veranda reading a newspaper they would observe he reads the paper but i dare say he has nothing to eat i never went home to see my own people when i came back from work i often found waiting for me little notes brief and anxious in which my sister wrote to me about my father that he had been particularly preoccupied at dinner and had eaten nothing or that he had been giddy and staggering or that he had locked himself in his room and had not come out for a long time such items of news troubled me i could not sleep and at times even walked up and down great dvoryansky street at night by our house looking in at the dark windows and trying to guess whether everything was well at home on sundays my sister came to see me but came in secret as though it were not to see me but our nurse and if she came in to see me she was very pale with tear-stained eyes and she began crying at once our father will never live through this she would say if anything should happen to him god grant it may not your conscience will torment you all your life it's awful misail for our mother's sake i beseech you reform your ways my darling sister i would say how can i reform my ways if i am convinced that i am acting in accordance with my conscience do understand i know you are acting on your conscience but perhaps it could be done differently somehow so as not to wound anybody ah holy saints the old woman sighed through the door your life is ruined there will be trouble my dears there will be trouble one sunday dr blagovo turned up unexpectedly he was wearing a military tunic over a silk shirt and high boots of patent leather i have come to see you he began shaking my hand heartily like a student i'm hearing about you every day and i have been meaning to come and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk as they say the boredom in the town is awful there is not a living soul not one to say a word to it's hot holy mother he went on taking off his tunic and sitting in his silk shirt my dear fellow let me talk to you i was dull myself and had for a long time been craving for the society of someone not a house painter i was genuinely glad to see him i'll begin by saying he said sitting down on my bed that i sympathize with you from the bottom of my heart and deeply respect the life you are leading they don't understand you here in the town and indeed there is no one to understand seeing that as you know they are all with very few exceptions regular gogolesque pig faces here but i saw what you were at once that time at the picnic you are a noble soul an honest high-minded man i respect you and feel it a great honor to shake hands with you he went on enthusiastically to have made such a complete and violent change of life as you have done you must have passed through a complicated spiritual crisis and to continue this manner of life now and to keep up to the high standard of your convictions continually must be a strain on your mind and heart from day to day now to begin our talk tell me don't you consider that if you had spent your strength of will 
this strained activity all these powers on something else for instance on gradually becoming a great scientist or artist your life would have been broader and deeper and would have been more productive we talked and when we got upon manual labor i expressed this idea that what is wanted is that the strong should not enslave the weak that the minority should not be a parasite on the majority nor a vampire for ever sucking its vital sap that is all without exception strong and weak rich and poor should take part equally in the struggle for existence each one on his own account and that there was no better means for equalizing things in that way than manual labor in the form of universal service compulsory for all then do you think every one without exception ought to engage in manual labor asked the doctor yes and don't you think that if every one including the best men the thinkers and great scientists taking part in the struggle for existence each on his own account are going to waste their time breaking stones and painting roofs may not that threaten a grave danger to progress where is the danger i asked why progress is in deeds of love in fulfilling the moral law if you don't enslave anyone if you don't oppress anyone what further progress do you want but excuse me blagova suddenly fired up rising to his feet but excuse me if a snail in its shell busied itself over perfecting its own personality and muddles about with the moral law do you call that progress why muddles i said offended if you don't force your neighbor to feed and clothe you to transport you from place to place and defend you from your enemies surely in the midst of a life entirely resting on slavery that is progress isn't it to my mind it is the most important progress and perhaps the only one possible and necessary for man the limits of universal world progress are an infinity and to talk of some possible progress limited by our needs and temporary theories is excuse my saying so positively strange if the limits of progress are in infinity as you say it follows that its aims are not definite i said to live without knowing definite what they are living for so be it but that's not knowing is not so dull as your knowing i am going up a ladder which is called progress civilization culture i go on and up without knowing definitely where i am going but really it is worth living for the sake of that delightful ladder while you know what you are living for you live for the sake of some peoples not enslaving others that the artist and the man who rubs his paints may dine equally well but you know that's the pity bourgeois kitchen gray side of life and surely it is revolting to live for that alone if some insects do enslave others bother them let them devour each other we need not think about them you know they will die and decay just the same however zealously you rescue them from slavery we must think of that great millennium which awaits humanity in the remote future blagovo argued warmly with me but at the same time one could see he was troubled by some irrelevant idea i suppose your sister is not coming he said looking at his watch she was at your house yesterday and said she would be seeing you today you keep saying slavery slavery he went on but you know that is a special question and all such questions are solved by humanity gradually we began talking of doing things gradually i said that the question of doing good or evil every one settles for himself without waiting till humanity settles it by the way of gradual development moreover this gradual progress has more than one aspect side by side with the gradual development of human ideas the gradual growth of ideas of another order is observed serfdom is no more but the capitalist system is growing 
and in the very heyday of emancipating ideas just as in the days of baddy the majority feeds clothes and defends the minority while remaining hungry inadequately clad and defenseless such an order of things can be made to fit in finely with any tendencies and currents of thought you like because the art of enslaving is also gradually being cultivated we no longer flog our servants in the stable but we give to slavery refined forms at least we succeed in finding a justification for it in each particular case ideas are ideas with us but if now at the end of the nineteenth century it were possible to lay the burden of the most unpleasant of our physiological functions upon the working class we should certainly do so and afterwards of course justify ourselves by saying that if the best people the thinkers and great scientists were to waste their precious time on these functions progress might be menaced with great danger but at this point my sister arrived seeing the doctor she was fluttered and troubled and began saying immediately that it was time for her to go home to her father cleopatra alexeyevna said blagovo earnestly pressing both hands to his heart what will happen to your father if you spend half an hour or so with your brother and me he was frank he knew how to communicate his liveliness to others after a moment's thought my sister laughed and all at once became suddenly gay as she had been at the picnic we went out into the country and lying in the grass went on with our talk and looked towards the town where all the windows facing west were like glittering gold because the sun was setting after that whenever my sister was coming to see me blagova turned up too and they always greeted each other as though their meeting in my room was accidental my sister listened while the doctor and i argued and at such times her expression was joyfully enthusiastic full of tenderness and curiosity and it seemed to me that a new world she had never dreamed of before and which she was now striving to fathom was gradually opening before her eyes when the doctor was not there she was quiet and sad and now if she sometimes shed tears as she sat on my bed it was for reasons of which she did not speak in august radish ordered us to be ready to go to the railway line two days before we were banished from the town my father came to see me he sat down and in a leisurely way without looking at me wiped his red face then took out of his pocket his own messenger and deliberately with emphasis on each word read out the news that the son of the branch manager of the state bank a young man of my age had been appointed head of a department in the exchequer and now look at you he said folding up the newspaper a beggar in rags good for nothing even working-class people and peasants obtain education in order to become men while you a polozniv with ancestors of rank and distinction aspire to the gutter but i have not come here to talk to you i have washed my hands of you he added in a stilted voice getting up i have come to find out where your sister is you worthless fellow she left home after dinner and here it is nearly eight and she is not back she has taken to going out frequently without telling me she is less dutiful and i see in it your evil and degrading influence where is she in his hand he had the umbrella i knew so well and i was already flustered and drew myself up like a schoolboy expecting my father to begin hitting me with it but he noticed my glance at the umbrella and most likely that restrained him live as you please he said i shall not give you my blessing holy saints my nurse muttered behind the door you poor unlucky child ah my heart bodes ill 
I worked on the railway line. It rained without stopping all August. It was damp and cold. They had not carried the corn in the fields, and on big farms where the wheat had been cut by machines, it lay not in sheaves but in heaps, and I remember how those luckless heaps of wheat turned blacker every day, and the grain was sprouting in them. It was hard to work. The pouring rain spoiled everything we managed to do. We were not allowed to leave or to sleep in the railway buildings, and we took refuge in the damp and filthy mud huts in which the navvies had lived during the summer, and I could not sleep at night for the cold and the wood lice crawling on my face and hands. And when we worked near the bridges, the navvies used to come in the evenings in a gang, simply in order to beat the painters. It was a form of sport to them. They used to beat us to steal our brushes, and to annoy us and rouse us to fight, they used to spoil our work. They would, for instance, smear over the signal boxes with green paint. To complete our troubles, Radish took to paying us very irregularly. All the painting work on the line was given out to a contractor. He gave it out to another, and this subcontractor gave it to Radish after subtracting 20% for himself. The job was not a profitable one in itself, and the rain made it worse. Time was wasted. We could not work while Radish was obliged to pay the fellows by the day. The hungry painters almost came to beating him, called him a cheat, a bloodsucker, a Judas, while he, poor fellow, sighed, lifted up his hand to heaven in despair, and was continually going to Madame Cheprakov for money. End of section four. Section 5 of The Chorus Girl and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The Chorus Girl and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. Translated by Constance Garnett. My Life. The Story of a Provincial. Part 3. Autumn came on rainy dark and muddy the season of unemployment set in and i used to sit at home out of work for three days at a stretch i did various little jobs not in the painting line for instance i wheeled earth earning about fourpence a day by it dr blagovo had gone away to petersburg my sister had given up coming to see me Radish was laid up at home, ill, expecting death from day to day. And my mood was autumnal, too. Perhaps because, having become a workman, I saw our town life only from the seamy side. It was my lot almost every day to make discoveries which reduced me almost to despair. Those of my fellow citizens, about whom I had no opinion before, or who had externally appeared perfectly decent, turned out now to be base, cruel people, capable of any dirty action. We common people were deceived, cheated, and kept waiting for hours together in the cold entry or the kitchen. We were insulted and treated with the utmost rudeness. In the autumn I papered the reading room and two other rooms at the club. I was paid a penny three farthings the piece, but had to sign a receipt at the rate of two pence halfpenny, and when I refused to do so, a gentleman of benevolent appearance in gold-rimmed spectacles, who must have been one of the club committee, said to me, "'If you say much more, you blackguard, I'll pound your face into a jelly and when the flunky whispered to him what i was the son of polisdim the architect he became embarrassed turned crimson but immediately recovered himself and said devil take him 
in the shops they palmed off on us workmen putrid meat musty flour and tea that had been used and dried again the police hustled us in church the assistants and nurses in the hospital plundered us and if we were too poor to give them a bribe they revenged themselves by bringing us food in dirty vessels in the post office the pettiest official considered he had a right to treat us like animals and to shout with coarse insolence you wait where are you shoving to even the house dogs were unfriendly to us and fell upon us with peculiar viciousness but the thing that struck me most of all in my new position was the complete lack of justice what is defined by the peasants in the words they have forgotten god rarely did a day pass without swindling we were swindled by the merchants who sold us oil by the contractors and the workmen and the people who employed us i need not say that there could never be a question of our rights and we always had to ask for money we earned as though it were a charity and to stand waiting for it at the back door cap in hand i was papering a room at the club next to the reading room in the evening when i was just getting ready to go the daughter of dolzhik of the engineer walked into the room with a bundle of books under her arm i bowed to her oh how do you do she said recognizing me at once and holding out her hand i'm very glad to see you she smiled and looked with curiosity and wonder at my smock my pail of paste the paper stretched on the floor i was embarrassed and she too felt awkward you must excuse my looking at you like this she said i have been told so much about you especially by dr blagovo he is simply in love with you and i have made the acquaintance of your sister too a sweet dear girl but i can never persuade her that there is nothing awful about your adopting the simple life on the contrary you have become the most interesting man in the town she looked again at the pail of paste and the wallpaper and went on i asked dr blagovo to make me better acquainted with you but apparently he forgot or had no time anyway we are acquainted all the same and if you would come and see me quite simply i should be extremely indebted to you i so long to have a talk i am a simple person she added holding out her hand to me and i hope that you will feel no constraint with me my father is not here he is in petersburg she went off into the reading room rustling her skirts while i went home and for a long time could not get to sleep that cheerless autumn some kind soul evidently wishing to alleviate my existence sent me from time to time tea and lemons or biscuits or roast game karpovna told me that they were always brought by a soldier and from whom they came she did not know and the soldier used to inquire whether i was well and whether i dined every day and whether i had warm clothing when the frosts began i was presented in the same way in my absence with a soft knitted scarf brought by the soldier there was a faint elusive smell of scent about it and i guessed who my good fairy was the scarf smelt of lilies of the valley the favorite scent of anyuta blagovo towards winter there was more work and it was more cheerful radish recovered and we worked together in the cemetery church where we were putting the groundwork on the icon stand before gilding it was a clean quiet job and as our fellows used to say profitable one could get through a lot of work in a day and the time passed quickly imperceptibly there was no swearing no laughter no loud talk the place itself compelled one to quietness and decent behavior and disposed one to quiet serious thoughts 
absorbed in our work we stood or sat motionless like statues there was a deathly silence in keeping with the cemetery so that if a tool fell or a flame sputtered in the lamp the noise of such sounds rang out abrupt and resonant and made us look round after a long silence we would hear a buzzing like the swarming of bees it was the requiem of a baby being chanted slowly in subdued voices in the porch or an artist painting a dove with stars round it on a cupola would begin softly whistling and recollecting himself with a start would at once relapse into silence or radish answering his thoughts would say with a sigh anything is possible anything is possible or a slow disconsolate bell would begin ringing over our heads and the painters would observe that it must be for the funeral of some wealthy person my days i spent in this stillness in the twilight of the church and in the long evenings i played billiards or went to the theatre in the gallery wearing the new trousers i had bought out of my own earnings concerts and performances had already begun at the ajogins radish used to paint the scenes alone now he used to tell me the plot of the plays and describe the tableau vivant which he witnessed i listened to him with envy i felt greatly drawn to the rehearsals but i could not bring myself to go to the ajogins a week before christmas dr blagovo arrived and again we argued and played billiards in the evening when he played he used to take off his coat and unbutton his shirt over his chest and for some reason tried altogether to assume the air of a desperate rake he did not drink much but made a great uproar about it and had a special faculty for getting through twenty roubles in an evening at such a poor cheap tavern as the volga my sister began coming to see me again they both expressed surprise every time on seeing each other but from her joyful guilty face it was evident that these meetings were not accidental one evening when we were playing billiards the doctor said to me i say why don't you go and see miss dolzhikov you don't know maria viktorovna she's a clever creature a charmer a simple good-natured soul i described how her father had received me in the spring nonsense laughed the doctor the engineer's one thing and she is another really my dear fellow you mustn't be nasty to her go and see her sometimes for instance let's go and see her tomorrow evening what do you say he persuaded me the next evening i put on my new serge trousers and in some agitation i set off to miss dolzhikov's the footman did not seem so haughty and terrible nor the furniture so gorgeous as on that morning when i had come to ask a favour maria viktorovna was expecting me and she received me like an old acquaintance shaking hands with me in a friendly way she was wearing a grey cloth dress with full sleeves and had her hair done in the style which we used to call dog's ears when it came into fashion in the town a year before the hair was combed down over the ears and this made maria viktorovna's face look broader and she seemed to me this time very much like her father whose face was broad and red with something in its expression like a sledge driver she was handsome and elegant but not youthful looking she looked thirty though in reality she was not more than twenty-five dear doctor how grateful i am to you she said making me sit down if it hadn't been for him you wouldn't have come to see me i am bored to death my father has gone away and left me alone and i don't know what to do with myself in this town then she began asking me where i was working now how much i earned where i lived do you spend on yourself nothing but what you earn she asked no 
happy man she sighed all the evil in life it seems to me comes from idleness boredom and spiritual emptiness and all this is inevitable when one is accustomed to living at other people's expense don't think i am showing off i tell you truthfully it is not interesting or pleasant to be rich make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness is said because there is not and cannot be a mammon that's righteous she looked round at the furniture with a grave cold expression as though she wanted to count it over and went on comfort and luxury have a magical power little by little they draw into their clutches even strong-willed people at one time father and i lived simply not in a rich style but now you see how it is something monstrous she said shrugging her shoulders we spend up to twenty thousand a year in the provinces one comes to look at comfort and luxury as the invariable privilege of capital and education i said and it seems to me that the comforts of life may be combined with any sort of labor even the hardest and dirtiest your father is rich and yet he says himself that it has been his lot to be a mechanic and an oiler she smiled and shook her head doubtfully my father sometimes eats bread dipped in kvass she said it's a fancy a whim at that moment there was a ring and she got up the rich and well-educated ought to work like everyone else she said and if there is comfort it ought to be equal for all there ought not to be any privileges but that's enough philosophizing tell me something amusing tell me about the painters what are they like funny the doctor came in i began telling them about the painters but being unaccustomed to talking i was constrained and described them like an ethnologist gravely and tediously the doctor too told us some anecdotes of working men he staggered about shed tears dropped on his knees and even mimicking a drunkard lay on the floor it was as good as a play and maria viktorovna laughed till she cried as she looked at him then he played on the piano and sang in his thin pleasant tenor while maria viktorovna stood by and picked out what she was to sing and corrected him when he made a mistake i've heard that you sing too i inquired sing too cried the doctor in horror she sings exquisitely a perfect artist and you talk of her singing too what an idea i did study in earnest at one time she said answering my question but now i have given it up sitting on a low stool she told us of her life in petersburg and mimicked some celebrated singers imitating their voice and manner of singing she made a sketch of the doctor in her album then of me she did not draw well but both the portraits were like us she laughed and was full of mischief and charming grimaces and this suited her better than talking about the mammon of unrighteousness and it seemed to me that she had been talking just before about wealth and luxury not in earnest but in imitation of someone she was a superb comic actress i mentally compared her with our young ladies and even the handsome dignified anyuta blagovo could not stand comparison with her the difference was immense like the difference between a beautiful cultivated rose and a wild briar we had supper together the three of us the doctor and maria viktorovna drank red wine champagne and coffee with brandy in it they clinked glasses and drank to friendship to enlightenment to progress to liberty and they did not get drunk but only flushed and were continually for no reason laughing till they cried so as not to be tiresome i drank claret too talented richly endowed natures said miss dolzhikov know how to live and go their own way 
mediocre people like myself for instance know nothing and can do nothing of themselves there is nothing left for them but to discern some deep social movement and to float where they are carried by it how can one discern what doesn't exist asked the doctor we think so because we don't see it is that so the social movements are the invention of the new literature there are none among us an argument began there are no deep social movements among us and never have been the doctor declared loudly there is no end to what the new literature has invented it has invented intellectual workers in the country and you may search through all our villages and find at the most some lout in a reefer jacket or a black frock coat who will make four mistakes in spelling a word of three letters cultured life has not yet begun among us there is the same savagery the same uniform boorishness the same triviality as five hundred years ago movements currents there have been but it has all been petty paltry bent upon vulgar and mercenary interests and one cannot see anything important in them if you think you have discerned a deep social movement and in following it you devote yourself to tasks in the modern taste such as the emancipation of insects from slavery or abstinence from beefy souls i congratulate you madam we must study and study and study and we must wait a bit with our deep social movements we are not mature enough for them yet and to tell the truth we don't know anything about them you don't know anything about them but i do said maria viktorovna goodness how tiresome you are today our duty is to study and to study to try to accumulate as much knowledge as possible for genuine social movements arise where there is knowledge and the happiness of mankind in the future lies only in knowledge i drink to science there is no doubt about one thing one must organize one's life somehow differently said maria viktorovna after a moment's silence and thought life such as it has been hitherto is not worth having don't let us talk about it as we came away from her the cathedral clock struck two did you like her asked the doctor she's nice isn't she on christmas day we dined with maria viktorovna and all through the holidays we went to see her almost every day there was never any one there but ourselves and she was right when she said that she had no friends in the town but the doctor and me we spent our time for the most part in conversation sometimes the doctor brought some book or magazine and read aloud to us in reality he was the first well-educated man i had met in my life i cannot judge whether he knew a great deal but he always displayed his knowledge as though he wanted other people to share it when he talked about anything relating to medicine he was not like any one of the doctors in our town but made a fresh peculiar impression on me and i fancied that if he liked he might have become a real man of science and he was perhaps the only person who had a real influence upon me at that time seeing him and reading the books he gave me I began little by little to feel a thirst for the knowledge which would have given significance to my cheerless labor. It seemed strange to me, for instance, that I had not known till then that the whole world was made up of sixty elements. I had not known what oil was, what paints were, and that I could have got on without knowing these things my acquaintance with the doctor elevated me morally too i was continually arguing with him and though i usually remained of my own opinion yet thanks to him i began to perceive that everything was not clear to me and i began trying to work out as far as i could definite convictions in myself 
that the dictates of conscience might be definite and that there might be nothing vague in my mind yet though he was the most cultivated and best man in the town he was nevertheless far from perfection in his manners in his habit of turning every conversation into an argument in his pleasant tenor even in his friendliness there was something coarse like a divinity student and when he took off his coat and sat in his silk shirt or flung a tip to a waiter in the restaurant i always fancied that culture might be all very well but the tartar was fermenting in him still at epiphany he went back to petersburg he went off in the morning and after dinner my sister came in without taking off her fur coat and her cap she sat down in silence very pale and kept her eyes fixed on the same spot she was chilled by the frost and one could see that she was upset by it you must have caught cold i said her eyes filled with tears she got up and went out to karpovna without saying a word to me as though i had hurt her feelings and a little later i heard her saying in a tone of bitter reproach nurse what have i been living for till now what tell me haven't i wasted my youth all the best years of my life to know nothing but keeping accounts pouring out tea counting the halfpence entertaining visitors and thinking there was nothing better in the world nurse do understand i have the cravings of a human being and i want to live and they have turned me into something like a housekeeper it's horrible horrible she flung her keys towards the door and they fell with a jingle into my room they were the keys of the sideboard of the kitchen cupboard of the cellar and of the tea caddy the keys which my mother used to carry oh merciful heavens cried the old woman in horror holy saints above before going home my sister came into my room to pick up the keys and said you must forgive me something queer has happened to me lately on returning home late one evening from maria victorovna's i found waiting in my room a young police inspector in a new uniform he was sitting at my table looking through my books at last he said getting up and stretching himself this is the third time i have been to you the governor commands you to present yourself before him at nine o'clock in the morning without fail he took from me a signed statement that i would act upon his excellency's command and went away this late visit of the police inspector and unexpected invitation to the governor's had an overwhelmingly oppressive effect upon me from my earliest childhood i have felt terror-stricken in the presence of gendarmes policemen and law court officials and now i was tormented by uneasiness as though i were really guilty in some way and i could not get to sleep my nurse and prokofy were also upset and could not sleep my nurse had earache too she moaned and several times began crying with pain hearing that i was awake prokofy came into my room with a lamp and sat down at the table you ought to have a drink of pepper cordial he said after a moment's thought if one does have a drink in this vale of tears it does no harm and if mamma were to pour a little pepper cordial in her ear it would do her a lot of good between two and three he was going to the slaughterhouse for the meat i knew i should not sleep till morning now and to get through the time till nine o'clock i went with him we walked with a lantern while his boy nikolka aged thirteen with blue patches on his cheeks from frostbites a regular young brigand to judge by his expression drove after us in the sledge urging on the horse in a husky voice i suppose they will punish you at the governor's 
prokofi said to me on the way there are rules of the trade for governors and rules for the higher clergy and rules for the officers and rules for the doctors and every class has its rules but you haven't kept to your rules and you can't be allowed the slaughterhouse was behind the cemetery and till then i had only seen it in the distance it consisted of three gloomy barns surrounded by a gray fence and when the wind blew from that quarter on hot days in summer it brought a stifling stench from them now going into the yard in the dark i did not see the barns i kept coming across horses and sledges some empty some loaded up with meat men were walking about with lanterns swearing in a disgusting way prokofy and nikolka swore just as revoltingly and the air was in a continual uproar with swearing coughing and the neighing of horses there was a smell of dead bodies and of dung it was thawing the snow was changing into mud and in the darkness it seemed to me that i was walking through pools of blood having piled up the sledges full of meat we set off to the butcher's shop in the market it began to get light cooks with baskets and elderly ladies in mantles came along one after another prokofy with a chopper in his hand in a white apron spattered with blood swore fearful oaths crossed himself at the church shouted aloud for the whole market to hear that he was giving away the meat at cost price and even at a loss to himself he gave short weight and short change the cooks saw that but deafened by his shouts did not protest and only called him a hangman brandishing and bringing down his terrible chopper he threw himself into picturesque attitudes and each time uttered the sound Heh! with a ferocious expression and i was afraid he really would chop off somebody's head or hand i spent all the morning in the butcher's shop and when at last i went to the governor's my overcoat smelt of meat and blood my state of mind was as though i were being sent spear in hand to meet a bear i remember the tall staircase with a striped carpet on it and the young official with shiny buttons who mutely motioned me to the door with both hands and ran to announce me i went into a hall luxuriously but frigidly and tastelessly furnished and the high narrow mirrors in the spaces between the walls and the bright yellow window curtains struck the eye particularly unpleasantly one could see that the governors were changed but the furniture remained the same again the young official motioned me with both hands to the door and i went up to a big green table at which a military general with the order of ledimer on his breast was standing mr polesniv i have asked you to come he began holding a letter in his hand and opening his mouth like a round o i have asked you to come here to inform you of this your highly respected father has appealed by letter and by word of mouth to the marshal of the nobility begging him to summon you and to lay before you the inconsistency of your behaviour with the rank of the nobility to which you have the honour to belong his excellency alexander pavlovitch justly supposing that your conduct might serve as a bad example and considering that mere persuasion on his part would not be sufficient but that official intervention in earnest was essential presents me here in this letter with his views in regard to you which i share he said this quietly respectfully standing erect as though i were his superior officer and looking at me with no trace of severity his face looked worn and wizened and was all wrinkles there were bags under his eyes his hair was dyed and it was impossible to tell from his appearance how old he was forty or sixty i trust 
he went on, that you appreciate the delicacy of our honoured Alexander Pavlovich, who has addressed himself to me not officially, but privately. I, too, have asked you to come here unofficially, and I am speaking to you not as a governor, but from a sincere regard to your father and so i beg you either to alter your line of conduct and return to duties in keeping with your rank or to avoid setting a bad example remove to another district where you are not known and where you can follow any occupation you please in the other case i shall be forced to take extreme measures he stood for half a minute in silence looking at me with his mouth open are you a vegetarian he asked no your excellency i eat meat he sat down and drew some papers towards him i bowed and went out it was not worth while now to go to work before dinner i went home to sleep but could not sleep from an unpleasant sickly feeling induced by the slaughter-house and my conversation with the governor and when the evening came i went gloomy and out of sorts to maria viktorovna i told her how i had been at the governor's while she stared at me in perplexity as though she did not believe it then suddenly began laughing gaily loudly irrepressibly as only good-natured laughter-loving people can if only one could tell that in petersburg she brought out almost falling over with laughter and propping herself against the table if one could tell that in petersburg now we used to see each other often sometimes twice a day she used to come to the cemetery almost every day after dinner and read the epitaphs on the crosses and tombstones while she waited for me sometimes she would come into the church and standing by me would look on while i worked the stillness the naive work of the painters and gilders radishes sage reflections and the fact that i did not differ externally from the other workmen and worked just as they did in my waistcoat with no socks on and that i was addressed familiarly by them all this was new to her and touched her one day a workman who was painting a dove on the ceiling called out to me in her presence misail uh, hand me up with the white paint i took him the white paint and afterwards when i let myself down by the frail scaffolding she looked at me touched to tears and smiling what a dear you are she said i remembered from my childhood how a green parrot belonging to one of the rich men of the town had escaped from its cage and how for quite a month afterwards the beautiful bird had haunted the town flying from garden to garden homeless and solitary maria viktorovna reminded me of that bird there is positively nowhere for me to go but the cemetery she said to me with a laugh the town has become disgustingly dull at the Zhorgins they are still reciting singing lisping i have grown to detest them of late your sister is an unsociable creature mademoiselle blagovo hates me for some reason i don't care for the theatre tell me where am i to go when i went to see her i smelt of paint and turpentine and my hands were stained and she liked that she wanted me to come to her in my ordinary working clothes but in her drawing-room those clothes made me feel awkward i felt embarrassed as though i were in uniform so i always put on my new serge trousers when i went to her and she did not like that you must own you are not quite at home in your new character she said to me one day your workman's dress does not feel natural to you you are awkward in it tell me isn't that because you haven't a firm conviction and are not satisfied the very kind of work you have chosen your painting surely it does not satisfy you does it she asked laughing 
i know paint makes things look nicer and last longer but those things belong to rich people who live in towns and after all they are luxuries besides you have often said yourself that everybody ought to get his bread by the work of his own hands yet you get money and not bread why shouldn't you keep to the literal sense of your words you ought to be getting bread that is you ought to be ploughing sowing reaping threshing or doing something which has a direct connection with agriculture for instance looking after cows digging building huts of logs she opened a pretty cupboard that stood near her writing table and said i am saying all this to you because i want to let you into my secret voila this is my agricultural library here i have fields kitchen garden and orchard and cattle yard and beehives i read them greedily and have already learned all the theory to the tiniest detail my dream my darling wish is to go to our dubechnya as soon as march is here it's marvelous there exquisite isn't it the first year i shall have a look round and get into things and the year after i shall begin to work properly myself putting my back into it as they say my father has promised to give me the bechnya and i shall do exactly what i like with it flushed excited to tears and laughing she dreamed aloud how she would live at dubechnya and what an interesting life it would be i envied her march was near the days were growing longer and longer and on bright sunny days water dripped from the roofs at midday and there was a fragrance of spring i too longed for the country and when she said that she should move to dubechnya i realized vividly that i should remain in the town alone and i felt that i envied her with her cupboard of books and her agriculture i knew nothing of work on the land and did not like it and i should have liked to have told her that work on the land was slavish toil but i remembered that something similar had been said more than once by my father and i held my tongue lent began viktor ivanitch whose existence i had begun to forget arrived from petersburg he arrived unexpectedly without even a telegram to say he was coming when i went in as usual in the evening he was walking about the drawing-room telling some story with his face freshly washed and shaven looking ten years younger his daughter was kneeling on the floor taking out of his trunks boxes bottles and books and handing them to pavel the footman i involuntarily drew back a step when i saw the engineer but he held out both hands to me and said smiling showing his strong white teeth that looked like a sledge driver's here he is here he is very glad to see you mr house painter masha has told me all about it she has been singing your praises i quite understand and approve he went on taking my arm to be a good workman is ever so much more honest and more sensible than wasting government paper and wearing a cockade on your head i myself worked in belgium with these very hands and then spent two years as a mechanic he was wearing a short reefer jacket and indoor slippers he walked like a man with the gout rolling slightly from side to side and rubbing his hands humming something he softly purred and hugged himself with satisfaction at being at home again at last and able to have his beloved shower bath there is no disputing he said to me at supper there is no disputing you are all nice and charming people but for some reason as soon as you take to manual labor or go in for saving the peasants in the long run it all comes to no more than being a dissenter aren't you a dissenter here you don't take vodka what's the meaning of that if it is not being a dissenter 
to satisfy him i drank some vodka and i drank some wine too we tasted the cheese the sausage the pates the pickles and the savouries of all sorts that the engineer had brought with him and the wine that had come in his absence from abroad the wine was first-rate for some reason the engineer got wine and cigars from abroad without paying duty the caviar and the dried sturgeon someone sent him for nothing he did not pay rent for his flat as the owner of the house provided the kerosene for the line and altogether he and his daughter produced on me the impression that all the best in the world was at their service and provided for them for nothing i went on going to see them but not with the same eagerness the engineer made me feel constrained and in his presence i did not feel free i could not face his clear guileless eyes his reflections wearied and sickened me i was sickened too by the memory that so lately i had been in the employment of this red-faced well-fed man and that he had been brutally rude to me it is true that he put his arm round my waist slapped me on the shoulder in a friendly way approved my manner of life but i felt that as before he despised my insignificance and only put up with me to please his daughter and i couldn't now laugh and talk as i liked and i behaved unsociably and kept expecting that in another minute he would address me as pantile as he did his footman pavel how my pride as a provincial and a workingman was revolted i a proletarian a house painter went every day to rich people who were alien to me and whom the whole town regarded as though they were foreigners and every day i drank costly wines with them and ate unusual dainties my conscience refused to be reconciled to it on my way to the house i sullenly avoided meeting people and looked at them from under my brows as though i really were a dissenter and when i was going home from the engineers i was ashamed of my well-fed condition above all i was afraid of being carried away whether i was walking along the street or working or talking to the other fellows i was all the time thinking of one thing only of going in the evening to see maria viktorovna and was picturing her voice her laugh her movements when i was getting ready to go to her i always spent a long time before my nurse's warped looking-glass as i fastened my tie my serge trousers were detestable in my eyes and i suffered torments and at the same time despised myself for being so trivial when she called to me out of the other room that she was not dressed and asked me to wait i listened to her dressing it agitated me i felt as though the ground were giving way under my feet and when i saw a woman's figure in the street even at a distance i invariably compared it it seemed to me that all our girls and women were vulgar that they were absurdly dressed and did not know how to hold themselves and these comparisons aroused a feeling of pride in me maria viktorovna was the best of them all and i dreamed of her and myself at night one evening at supper with the engineer we ate a whole lobster as i was going home afterwards i remembered that the engineer twice called me my dear fellow at supper and i reflected that they treated me very kindly in that house as they might an unfortunate big dog who had been kicked out by its owners that they were amusing themselves with me and that when they were tired of me they would turn me out like a dog i felt ashamed and wounded wounded to the point of tears as though i had been insulted and looking up at the sky i took a vow to put an end to all this the next day i did not go to the dolzhikovs late in the evening when it was quite dark and raining i walked along great dvoryansky street looking up at the windows 
Everyone was asleep at the Azhogins, and the only light was in one of the furthest windows. It was Madame Azhogin in her own room, sewing by the light of three candles, imagining that she was combating superstition. Our house was in darkness, but at the Dolzhikovs, on the contrary, the windows were lighted up, but one could distinguish nothing through the flowers and the curtains. I kept walking up and down the street. The cold March rain drenched me through. I heard my father come home from the club. He stood knocking at the gate. A minute later a light appeared at the window, and I saw my sister, who was hastening down with a lamp, while with the other hand she was twisting her thick hair together as she went. Then my father walked about the drawing-room, talking and rubbing his hands, while my sister sat in a low chair, thinking and not listening to what he said. But then they went away, the light went out. I glanced round at the engineers, and there, too, all was darkness now. In the dark and the rain I felt hopelessly alone, abandoned to the whims of destiny. I felt that all my doings, my desires, and everything I had thought and said till then were trivial in comparison with my loneliness, in comparison with my present suffering, and the suffering that lay before me in the future. Alas, the thoughts and doings of living creatures are not nearly so significant as their sufferings and without clearly realizing what I was doing, I pulled at the bell of the Dolzhikov's gate, broke it, and ran along the street like some naughty boy with a feeling of terror in my heart, expecting every moment that they would come out and recognize me. When I stopped at the end of the street to take breath, I could hear nothing but the sound of the rain, and somewhere in the distance a watchman striking on a sheet of iron. For a whole week I did not go to the Dolzhikovs. My serge trousers were sold. There was nothing doing in the painting trade. I knew the pangs of hunger again and earned from twopence to fourpence a day, where I could, by heavy and unpleasant work. Struggling up to my knees in the cold mud, straining my chest, I tried to stifle my memories, and, as it were, to punish myself for the cheeses and preserves with which I had been regaled at the engineers. But all the same, as soon as I lay in bed, wet and hungry, my sinful imagination immediately began to paint exquisite, seductive pictures, and with amazement I acknowledged to myself that I was in love passionately in love, and I fell into a sound, heavy sleep, feeling that hard labor only made my body stronger and younger. One evening snow began falling most inappropriately, and the wind blew from the north as though winter had come back again. When I returned from work that evening, I found Maria Victorovna in my room. She was sitting in her fur coat, and had both hands in her muff. "'Why don't you come to see me?' she asked, raising her clear, clever eyes, and I was utterly confused with delight and stood stiffly upright before her, as I used to stand facing my father when he was going to beat me. She looked into my face, and I could see from her eyes that she understood why I was confused. Why don't you come to see me? she repeated. If you don't want to come, you see, I have come to you. She got up and came close to me. Don't desert me, she said, and her eyes filled with tears. I am alone, utterly alone. She began crying, and hiding her face in her muff, articulated, Alone? My life is hard very hard, and in all the world I have no one but you. Don't desert me. Looking for a handkerchief to wipe her tears, she smiled. 
we were silent for some time then i put my arms round her and kissed her scratching my cheek till it bled with her hatpin as i did it and we began talking to each other as though we had been on the closest terms for ages and ages end of section five